Welcome to Passion and Reply, and welcome to Great Albums. It's time to break outside the Anglosphere and take a look at one of the finest synth-pop acts to come from Belgium, the irreverent post-disco trio of Telex. Telex were in fact so European that they were sent to that most European of institutions, the Eurovision Song Contest, in the year 1980, in what was perhaps their finest hour in the spotlight. Many contemporary listeners may find Eurovision amusing, it actually didn't go over well in the contest itself, and Telex managed to place second to last on behalf of the Belgian people, losing even the arguably more illustrious last place to Finland. It was one of the earliest true joke entries, so perhaps the masses weren't ready for this approach yet. Despite its generally upbeat sound, I think the lyrics of Eurovision come across as really quite harsh and the song's availability in both English and French meant that plenty of people understood them. Mocking the financial instability of Italy and apparently anyone dumb enough to tune into Eurovision, there's really a rather condescending, perhaps even cruel, sensibility about it. A conspicuous reference to the Berlin Wall, a symbol of some of Europe's deepest divisions and greatest political turmoil, gives it an extra nudge toward feeling rather contextually inappropriate. Telex's Eurovision might just be the most cynical or anti-European song ever entered. At least up until Hatari of Iceland gave us the thunderous industrial anthem Hatrid Munsigra in 2019. Telex's follow-up to this incident is, in my opinion, where their career starts to really get interesting. While it isn't that heavily advertised, 1981's Sex was actually something of a collaboration album, featuring English-language lyrics on all tracks, which were contributed by Ron and Russell Mail of Sparks. Given the recent resurgence of interest in Sparks, spurred by Edgar Wright's documentary on them, I figured now is as good a time as ever to revisit this somewhat lesser-known work in the Sparks catalog. Or at least with one foot in the Sparks catalog. In my opinion, Sex takes the better aspects of both of these groups and combines them into something that feels like more than the sum of its parts. Telex's soft yet sprightly synth arrangements have as much fun and flair as those of fellow Sparks collaborator Giorgio Moroder, and feel more substantive and organic than Sparks' many attempts to play with various genres in which they remained outsider dilettantes. Likewise, the Male Brothers' lyricism is a major improvement to the often clunky English offered by previous efforts by the Belgians. Recontextualized amidst a sea of dreamy Europop and delivered by Telex's suave yet unassuming vocalist Michel Meurs, the same style of lyricism that often makes Sparks feel crass and overwrought to me becomes transmuted into something I'm much more amenable to. Much like Devo, I've often found the smartest guys in the room vibe of Sparks a bit off-putting, but sex has a certain subtlety or ambiguity about it that keeps me coming back and pondering it.
The feel-good, squelching bass grooves of Dummy recall the most affable work of the seminal Yellow Magic Orchestra, and a falsetto hook that's to die for marks it as one of the more pop-oriented tracks on the album. Had it stopped at Dummy, Hey, I'm Talking to You, it would be not only less interesting musically, but also conceptually. The overt questioning, now who's the dumb one, rescues it from simply being mean. I like to think it calls to mind the archetype of the fool who is constantly vocally doubting the intelligence of others in an attempt to cover for their own insecurities. While it's a comparatively simple track lyrically, it establishes some of the album's most important themes, portraying traditional intelligence as mutable and perhaps questionable. Despite its appeal, Dummy was actually not included on the original track listing of the album, but rather debuted as the B-side to the single Brainwash, before receiving this promotion in later revisions of the LP. In this rare case, I actually think the later edition is superior, and it's the one I generally recommend. Just sharing opposite sides of the same single, there's also a strong thematic connection between Dummy and the slower-paced, narrative-driven Brainwash. Arguably the most high-concept track to be had on sex, Brainwash tells the tale of an intellectual who willingly forfeits his intelligence for the sake of falling in love. That in and of itself is a take on the love song that I've never heard before. We all know the trope that being in love makes one stupid. Our word, infatuation, is basically Latin for being made stupid. But Brainwash suggests that given the choice, we might well be better off as fools rushing in. What good is a life full of knowledge if it is one without passion and that deeper humanity? The narrator of Brainwash seems fully cognizant of what they abandon and makes an informed decision to do so. But what complicates things even further is the development that the object of the narrator's affections seems desperate to make them regain their prior book smarts. Perhaps a commentary on how society frames this issue and its willingness to prioritize the prestige of education over genuine human happiness. The single Haven't We Met Somewhere Before explores a related but also distinct tension between knowledge and happiness.
so than anything else on the album, Haven't We Met Somewhere Before is really sort of harrowing. Morris's falsetto feels less like a fun disco aftershock and more like a cry of pain, and the stilted melody and more brash synthesizer stabs establish an air of unease, though still not so strong when it feels out of place alongside lighter tracks like Brainwash. Its lyrical narrative is plainly a tragic one, with a narrator who thinks he's encountered his wife but can't quite piece it together or get the response that he's looking for. It's evocative of the very real agony a sufferer of dementia and their loved ones might face, losing their memories and with them their connection to the people around them. But perhaps the most eerie thing about the track is that it never does dip into more maudlin territory, even if it feels like it ought to. In the full context of the album, and particularly the sentiment expressed by Brainwash, we're forced to question just how unfortunate the tale expressed in this song is. Perhaps Haven't We Met Somewhere Before is also suggesting that love is more powerful than knowledge, in its own way. Perhaps the characters it presents have transcended the need for knowledge of their shared history because their bond is deeper and more primal than that. Similarly, subversive questions about love are also posed by Exercise is Good For You. It's okay. With a pleasingly abrasive, textured synth line and a rather singable refrain, Exercise is Good For You is the one track cut from the later version of the album that I do find myself missing. This track's narrator has devoted themselves to exercising, perhaps over-exercising, in the wake of a bad breakup. At first blush, it may seem a bit absurd, but this is a real-life coping mechanism, and one that can potentially be quite dangerous, particularly as it's often combined with eating disorders. The potential for peril is compounded by the notion that, well, exercise is good for you, and that in a world where too few of us partake, anyone who does must be doing the best for their health. While it doesn't deal with the realm of knowledge, I do think Exercise is Good For You works in a similar space as tracks like Brainwash and Haven't We Met Somewhere Before do, offering an ambiguous narrative that asks us to question something we habitually value, in this case by portraying the apparent virtue of physical fitness in a darker and less healthy light. Earlier, I referred to this album simply as Sex, but for the UK market it was rechristened Birds and Bees. There is obviously something quite transgressive and irreverent about naming a pop album Sex. We like to think of pop music as trading chiefly in themes of love and romance, so the title Sex functions as a bit of a low blow, suggesting that we ought to think more cynically about uh, what's really going on below. Despite this, there's really not a lot of terribly bawdy tracks to be had on either version of the album, which may come as some surprise if you're familiar with their early track Pakmavast. I think the fact that the album title was changed and seemingly censored with the very knowing title Birds and Bees only adds to its transgressiveness and lends it a certain allure of the forbidden. You won't find birds or bees on the cover of the album, however, but rather a butterfly feeding off the nectar to large flowers. It's certainly an image that can be read as evocative of sensuality with yonic visual undertones. Perhaps more overtly offensive to the eye is its queasy, dull yellow color scheme, which is actually much more stuck in the 70s than the rather sharp and with it electro disco stylings of the music. Historically, the butterfly is often used as a symbol of innocence, particularly with respect to the carnal knowledge of sex. In Francois Girard's depiction of the mythological heroine Psyche, a butterfly hovers above the subject as she receives her first kiss from her lover, Cupid, a god of lust and sexual desire. The suggestion of youthful innocence is only heightened when the title Birds and Bees is applied. 
We might also consider the similarity between the idea of naivete or innocence as a virtue and the apparent thrust of tracks like Brainwash, which also challenge the utility and benefit of knowledge about the world. Telex would go on to release three more LPs after this one, and while they never quite surpassed a cult following, they keep up with the times quite respectably, incorporating sampling and digital synth textures without losing their signature levity and playfulness. I think they're well worth a listen if you're interested so far. My favorite track on this album is one that's exclusive to the later release and never appeared anywhere else, Mata Hari, which was not only added to the album but given the prominent position as its opening track. Mata Hari was actually a real person, a courtesan famous for her exotic dances inspired by her time in the Dutch East Indies. But she became caught up in the political storm of the First World War, and the French government convicted her of spying for the Germans, even though many believed she was framed. After her execution for the alleged crime, her severed head was embalmed and displayed in a Parisian museum for all to gawk at, until it mysteriously went missing, possibly stolen by an admirer. It's a strange and tragic tale for sure, and one suitably treated with a sense of mystery and uncertainty by the song. An undoubtedly complex and controversial figure, Mata Hari can be seen as a symbol of European disunity, not unlike the Berlin Wall, as well as a representation of sensuality used for devious and destructive ends. I think this track enriches the album's themes while also feeling somewhat separate with its more pensive mood and third-person lyricism. That's everything for today. Thanks, as always, for listening. Make up.